Hoy en el set con Fernando, una persona muy importante en mi vida. Y lo voy a entrevistar en inglés. Mi primera vez en inglés. Are you ready, Larry? I'm ready, Are you Daniel. sure? Yes, okay, I'm ready. Let's go. Let's go. Thanks, Larry, for your time. I know you've been very busy in this visit to Chile. You did clinics, speeches but also you have time for the friends. So thank you so much and welcome again welcome. to Chile. You're welcome. And everybody knows you as, as a tennis coach. Yes. Because you have two good players from, from Chile, and, but no many people knows about when, on your career, on your, when you were a tennis player. Yes. What the memories you have from there? Um, well, before I started professional, I went to school in the States at California, Berkeley. I graduated, so I got a degree. I spent four years, um, playing tennis there in the college system. And then I had nowhere else to do but turn pro. And so my options were either turn pro or go to work. Uh, I had a vision in my mind, you know, that I wanted to play professionally. Uh, and uh, I went to Europe for six months right after college. Nonstop. Six Nonstop. Months. And I was told by one of the ex uh, uh, players at Berkeley that that's what you must do, go to Europe play on the clay, learn, you know, a different way, a different culture, different balls, hotels. You need to get out of your comfort zone and really learn how to play on, on different surfaces. Because so, that, that is not very common in, I in know the American it's players. I know it's not. And, and, and I went there and um, for six months, I think I won two singles matches <laughs> and I did well in doubles because no nobody knew how to play doubles. Okay. So uh, doubles kind of made, you know, some money playing the doubles and the singles was a nightmare and I came back after six months I was 22 years old I throw my rackets in the closet I said I'm done with this and um, uh, a good friend of mine and my father-in-law recommended me to go to Napa California to work with a very old guy he was 85 years old um, his name was Tom Stowe and he was Don Budge's coach okay. and if people people don't know Don Budge he won the Grand Slam of tennis, that's all four major titles in the late 30s. And uh, he coached, uh, Don Budge was from Oakland, California, and he was living in Napa. And um, I started working with him for eight months to a year. And I didn't play any tournaments. Oh. I know, I, I, just, I just said, if I can't play, you know, because I, I, was, I was so bad um, going from college to the pros that this guy basically saved my career because he, he, he told me how to, first of all, I knew that I wasn't, you know, adequate in footwork, balance, preparation. Every ball seemed like, you know, past me before I even started. So I was late on every ball. He believed that every ball should be taken early. And so he gave me a concept. And you, you was really convinced at that time? He helped you to convince yourself? No. No, I, <laughs> no I, I said, I, when I started with him yeah. after, after, okay, I was driving five days a week, two hours there, two hours back to my house. Okay? Every single day? Every single day for no eight way. months. And what I happened? was very motivated, you know, that I wanted to be a real player. And the thing that kept pushing me was my wife's father who played professional football and knew Tom. He was the most valuable he, player of the NFL. He was, he was. Yeah. And he played 17 years for the 49ers. And um, he was my mentor, my sounding board. And when I wanted to quit, he said, no, 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 you're going back to Tom. And Tom was very, very strict. And he was kind of, and he was 85. I mean, he was a very old man, but he knew what great players did to be successful at the highest level. And then I, re I remember once you told me that you have to play third round of the US Open against yes. Borg. Yes, in um, 81. And, and he was so nervous. So nervous. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes, that, that, that's an understatement. That's yeah, an and, understatement. I, and I remember that you talk about Bjorn Borg that time, yes. and he came yes. to you very humble. Yes, like, very humbly. Yeah, and he came to you high on Bjorn Borg before the yeah. match. Yeah, and <laughs> <laughs> he came, and I was so lucky because at that time, the, 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 the locker room was across the way from Louis Armstrong. There were 18,000 people, and I'd never played in an environment like that, and it was the third round. I was playing well, you know, and he came up to me, and there was not a soul in the locker room at the time. 
And so he walked up and I, he said, hello, I'm Bjorn. I went to introduce myself. He was so classy. Yeah. And he said, um, it's a big crowd tonight. And I, I started, <laughs> I said, and I, he really, really made me comfortable. And I never forgot that. Um, and years later, when he came back at 36, when after he retired, we talked about it because he played for the uh, L.A. Strings and they hired me because I knew him so well to be the player coach for Team Tennis. And so we talked about, do you remember in 81 when I played? And he goes, oh, yeah. And I told him, I said, I really appreciated, you know, you coming to me and make me feel comfortable because you had Leonard Berglund right there and he had the 17 rackets walking into the court. And, you know, he, he was the only guy with a coach. In, in 81 and everyone else just played tennis you know so he had all so I even when we walked out it was literally in those days it, he was a rock star and it was so many people mass of people from going from the old locker room to the center court you had to go through maybe 50 yards to get to the main stadium and so there were so many people you couldn't walk and Bjorn made sure that he never disconnected and the security is kind of pushing me out and so he was always that kind of a human being. And, and in that time you were thinking about to become a tennis coach after? No. No? No, I really never thought, you know, when you're a player and um, you're in the heat of the mo you're in the heat of competition. I I I test myself. I don't want to be a coach. I think you know because of the troubles, because of the life. No, I just thought I thought coaching. You know, I knew there wasn't many really good coaches, but it was very difficult for me to give up my competitive spirit. And and if, and and we we talked about this with certain players like Nadal, Borg. You know, it's very difficult when you give up the playing. And you know, that's in your heart and soul. And that transition can take whatever time it is, whether a couple years, four years, five years. For me, um, it took, you know, I had my first child and I, I had a couple of shoulder operations. I, I, I still felt like I could play even at 34, but the reality was that wasn't gonna happen. Um, after taking a year and a half off with surgery, coming back, I qualified for two tournaments in Asia and then I couldn't lift my arm, and I was 34 years old. I looked in the mirror and I said, I'm done. I'm done. And then... One day to another. What? No, no, literally, it. no, no, it was, that's it. Yeah. I, I, I Which year so you won the Indian Wolves? How old are you? 85. 85. How I was 27. 27. I played my best tennis. Yeah, and I, I was, always you know, saw the picture in Yeah, and so, yeah, I know that, that, that's good for Roddick, because yeah. he, he, <laughs> Roddick always gets very angry when he sees that picture. That's one, the only tournament in North America Roddick never won. Oh. People don't know this, but he won the Canadian Open, Miami. He won everything yeah. except Indian Wells. He goes, and he, he was there like two years ago. He goes, I still have to see that stupid <laughs> picture. And he lost to Lubitsch in the finals oh, yeah. with me. And, and he, he said, oh, I can't believe I lost this guy. And then he won uh, Key Biscayne the next week. But it still bothers him that his picture is not in that, in that hallway. <laughs> and after you quit, you start to make like tennis business? I, 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 I taught at a club, okay? okay? And... Um, the La Quinta Hotel, which I was the touring pro. So I was actually working literally. You, you won the tournament, they hold you. Yes, yes. La Quinta. You know, and I, I just, they gave me an opportunity. I took, I think, two years off of doing nothing. Okay. And trying to get my, my mind in order to making this transition, which wasn't easy for me. And I started teaching individuals. And then I said, after that, you know, after one year, I did that for one year teaching at the club level. Uh, made a lot of money. But I said, I can't do this. I can't, I just can't do it. I, I have to be around at least, now I'm getting a little older, okay? I'm, I'm in, you know, I'm the 36 now, 30, about 35, 36. And I said, I have to do something a little bit more gratifying, a little bit that can actually fill that void of com competition that, you know, when you walk away, it's very tough to fill that void. And the best thing I could, my father-in-law said, you know, Larry, you should be a coach. I said, ah, I'm not gonna be a coach. He said, because you're so good at, a, you can communicate very well, but you can pass on these things that if you have learned, you know, from Tom Stowe, from what you learned on the tour, you have a lot of experience because it was 10 years that I was on the road. And he says, there's no coaches out there that really know what they're doing, you know? So that kind of, that kind of convinced me, you know, and I don't have a lot of um, people that I trust, you know, in that in telling me what I should, you know, my journey in life or whatever. But my father-in-law was the biggest influence, I would say, you know, in that, in that process. I had to take a look at that, you know, moving forward, you know, and starting a family and, uh, but, you know, going back on the road 35 weeks, that was always something I was a very difficult decision I didn't want to do. From, from your wife, from That's Kelly, right. from your family. 
and, and, and luckily we decided together you're going to be, we, we, we don't believe in two, you know, professions at once. She was going to be the, uh, the home person and everything was going to be safe. And she convinced me everything is going to be safe. You go and, um, or, you know, make a living. And then you have a, a big challenge with John McEnroe. Yes. He came to you. Yes. What do you think about me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, um, I was hired by Jeannie Buss, who is the current owner now of the LA Lakers. Okay, at that time, she ran the tennis division for her dad, Jerry Buss, at the Great Western Forum in LA. And she hired me as a consultant okay. for one reason only, to get John McEnroe to play an exhibition at the Great Western Forum. Now, John McEnroe may be one of the best players of all time. He's, got, he's, he's definitely in the conversation, you know. And this was 1989, I think it was. And... I, and Johnny refused to play in L.A., even though he had a house in Malibu and he was always in L.A. But he said, I'm not playing in L.A. And, I, and, and so we went to Indian Wells, Jeannie and I. I was in a suit, you know, and I said, Johnny, you come on, you got to play. He goes, who do you want to play? Do you want to play Edberg? Do you want to play Becker? Do you want to play Agassi? I'm not playing Agassi. I'm not playing Edberg. I'm not playing Becker. I'm not playing Sampras. I said, so you and Agassi was four in the world at that time. So I said, well, okay, Agassi's great because, you know, he had the hair and he was still very young, had not won a slam, okay? He had basically, you know, but he said, I'll play him. I said, you, and so Jeannie was going, oh my God, you got, but I've known Johnny since he was 14. Okay. So we have a long history, you know, even though I'm two years older and he was at Stanford when I was at Cal Berkeley, you know, for the one year. Uh, he, I got, I convinced him to play. <laughs> yeah, because it's not easy to no. handle that kind of personality. Personality, and he doesn't yeah. trust a lot of people. That's you know, so he he knew my you know my record, and we've been friends for a long time before he was a superstar. So we and and, and then he was a superstar. Yes. And then you have the job to convince him to play an exhibition. Yes, in L.A. And, and then never... the, he asked you, "What do you think about it? About the, me?" Yes, I said, "You stink." <laughs> He was, now his ranking had dropped, okay? And he lost to Agassi very, very badly. In that exhibition? He lost 6-2, 6-1. Oh, wait. And who is he pointing the finger at? Who is he blaming? <laughs> to you. Me. <laughs> you know, every second, he comes into the locker room, turns off all the lights, and he's only him. And he tells the guard, no one comes in here. Well, I'm in a suit and tie, I'm a bit, you know, because I'm working for Genie Bus, and I put on the exhibition, 18,000 people. He just got humiliated. And I go, and then the, I guard, and I tried to push the guard away, and he said, "No one's going." I said, "Get out of the way!" And I, we went. I went inside. I turned the lights on. He goes, "Who is that?" And I said, "It's me. What are you doing?" You know. And he goes, "This is." And he, he's going. He's he's not happy. I'll put it that way. And he's pointing his finger at you. You. I said, "No, no, no, no. Don't blame me. Okay. This is on you, because you come in. This is not 1984. This is 1989. Okay. And you haven't done any work. You're the greatest player I've ever seen. And we started talking." And then he looked at me, he goes, want a beer? <laughs> so he drank a couple beers and I calmed him down just because, of, you know, he's always wanting to point the finger at somebody. But I said, that's on you. So I left, I left and went home and he called me and he said, will you come to my house in Malibu tomorrow at night? I, I was shocked. I was at the hotel room with my wife and I said, what? You know, and, and, and I said, okay. And I, we went, we went to his house on the beach in Malibu and he, and he, I got there at least. Meet me there at 10 o'clock. I went there. We talked for eight hours. I refused to coach him because I know the animal, because I've known him for so long. I said, you don't listen to anybody. You know everything about everything. I'm not coaching. I'm not coaching. Please, please, please. You're the only guy I trust. I, and, he, and his favorite line that sticks in my head, he goes, misery loves company. That was how, and I, I kind of thought to myself, okay, I'm still 36. You know, I can hang with this guy. He's out of shape. He's 30 years old, 30, 31. Yeah, he was He's out like, of shape at that time. Totally out of shape. Oh, no, no, he no, didn't no. want to recognize that. No, he did, not want to, he did not want to do any work, but that's why he wanted me. Because I've always been a physical uh, buff, a, you know, a guy that is always active. And you made, me to, you made him to commit. Yes. To run every day. Every day. But he says, I only do it if you run with me. <laughs> And I said, okay. So he hired Tony. Tony was an ex-Vietnam vet that became a trainer, and he traveled with us everywhere. I was in New York that year, that first year, 40 weeks, 42 weeks, I think it was. And I had a baby, so it was a huge commitment. 
in Vietnam. That first that, year. He, he was oh, like, oh yeah. Tony was like, and Tony, I mean, we would go in the gym. Okay, he had full in, gym in New York and treadmills and Versa climbers. And this guy was, I mean, Johnny got very, very fit. Okay, and because I, I was two, two and a half years older than him. And so if I'm running circles around him, he's getting angry. Okay, so that's how Johnny's mentality is. So I was always pushing him. I said, you're a wimp, you, what is this? And Tony would laugh and then he would get, Johnny's very, you know how competitive yeah, he is. I know. You know. <laughs> so he really worked very, very hard for those two years together in his tennis. He was ranked like 28, he got back in the top eight. Yeah, know, I remember. At 33. A, yeah, early 90s, like. Yes, early 90s. He did 90, yeah. in Wimbledon. And Quarter, he beat Becker at yeah. the Australian, you know, and he played very, very well and he lost to Courier at the US Open that year and Courier was one in the world then. Yeah, we need to stop a little bit and vamos a una pausa y seguimos hablando de los jugadores que tuvo Larry. Sí, este libro lo hice hace varios años atrás, eh, libros fotográficos, eh, porque mucha gente me preguntaba cómo es Chile, mucha gente en el mundo cuando llegaba un torneo en los países bien lejanos y claro, y me demoraba un buen rato en, en describir lo que, lo que era la Patagonia, lo que son los volcanes, lo que son los paisajes, lo que es el desierto, lo que es nuestro litoral central, lo que es nuestro patrimonio. Eh, y aquí lo, lo dejo impreso para que se pueda disfrutar y disfrutar en detalle, en papel, o sea que se está perdiendo por hoy. Así que aquí lo hice con, con mucho cariño, mucha dedicación y sobre todo mucho amor por, por Chile. And how, how was the end of the, your relation with the John McEnroe? Like, the beautiful thing about Johnny is that when he retired after the US Open, we hugged. He said, I'm never going to play another tennis match. Well, he played doubles after that um, with, uh, I think, Woodford and won the doubles at the US Open, but he never played another singles match. He goes, I'm done. You know, the last two years, my goal was to win a slam. It didn't happen. I'm 33 years old. I'm finished. And, you know, that was beautiful because he, he never really played again. And then I had an opportunity to move on. And then what do you think about after that moment? You saw that you have talent. You like to be a tennis coach. Yes. Because after John yes. came Rios, maybe a yes. couple right. of years. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, within a very short period of time. Okay. Okay. Now Johnny, Johnny was very difficult. I mean, he took a lot out of out of you when you when you coach him because the demand, yeah, and his intensity and the way he went about his business. So, for me, when IMG and Marcelo came to Palm Springs, they said, "I want you to look at this little lefty. He's a little volatile in the head, like John McEnroe." I went to, I went like this. I went, "Oh my God!" I'm not, <laughs> I mean, this. Okay, I just went two years with a guy that's very intense, and I said, oh, I my patience was a little low at that time." Okay. Um, and so when he came to Palm Springs, um, the first moments we met uh, on the on the, I've never met the kid. I watched him play in the juniors when he is when in his last year of the juniors at the U.S. Open juniors, but. It wasn't a good experience, okay? I almost, I, I, you know, he wasn't acting very well, and I grabbed my stuff and I left. I said, I don't need that. And then his agent followed me to the car and said, please, 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 he flew in from the East Coast this morning. You had him on the court. He's a little grumpy, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, dude, I'm, okay, I, I'm gonna go to lunch. I'm gonna come back at two o'clock. So you better talk to him. And um, at that time, you know, he had lost nine first rounds in a row. So he was not doing well. And uh, I don't know who was with him at the time. I don't know anything. And he came back in the afternoon and he was much, much better. 
He had a, bit, a little bit better perspective, and he and he tried on the practice court for an hour. I said, I just want to see how good you are. I don't. I, I've never. I've never. You know, seen you play, and um, he he was very impressive um, that second time around. So that's how it was. The introduction was um, when he, when I first met him, um, and then I was with him from that time for about three and a half years. Oh, that's a lot. In three and a half years with Marcelo, there was a six month, a, six that, month break. That's a great effort. That is a- Macaro. Uh, uh, to, to, to Rios, okay, now, okay, now you see these gray hairs? You know, this is, this is why, this is why, that was why. But it, you know, it taught me a, a lot about, you know, especially Johnny, what it takes to be a great player. You learn a lot from every, every great player. You learn something besides what you all already know. And you accumulate all this data and then you try to pass it on. And that's what coaching is all about. Regardless of, you know, if they're a serve volleyer, a baseliner, mentality is very, very important. Yeah, and then, well, everybody knows about what you did with Rios. Yes. And then it was done. I mean, it was done. I, I know that you don't like to talk about it and we can Only pass. for you. <laughs> <laughs> but after Rios came Cafelico. Yes, very quickly after. Yeah, you won McEnroe, Rios. To a Russian. To a Russian. To a Russian. And also you won a Grand Slam with him. Yes. Number one in the world. Gold medal. Gold medal. At Sydney. Right after the Australian, two months after they went to Sydney and he won a gold medal. And it's that's I mean, diversity of the nationalities of your players. Yes. Because I'm sure you have many history of <laughs> We have many, many stories of Yegeni. You know, one thing, my father-in-law and I, who is kind of my sounding board, he said, Larry, you don't you don't coach countries. You coach athletes. And so I always felt that that was something that resonated. I coached, I've coached Chileans, English, Russians, Americans. I mean, I coach athletes and, and they all have similar mentalities. Yeah, but it's still because most of the American coaches train the Americans, That's the right. Spanish in Spanish. That's right. I mean, they're always like in yeah. Australian, French, yes. whatever. Yes. But you're one of the only ones that... I know. You... I love that challenge. Yeah. It, it is a challenge. It is. And the language barrier, I, okay, I'm, I'm heritage of Ukrainian, so I do speak a little bit of Russian. And, you know, Yevgeny and I, you know, his mentality was very confident, okay? And he, he always felt like he, no one could beat him, okay? So he really he, he was losing interest in the tour there was wasn't a lot of common ground for a lot of he didn't have a lot of friends okay but he yeah, had already uh, won the was French. about Jevy. Yeah. When, I, when I saw Jevy on the yeah. locker room when yeah. I was 21 That's years right. old I yeah. saw him and said oh my god yeah. I like this guy because he looked at me like like yeah. a Russian then, <laughs> and then yeah. I talked to him a yeah. few times and yeah. he's nice he's funny Very guy nice. he's, he's funny. really funny guy yeah he is but on this on the, on the first time that yes. I saw him inside it was oh my god I don't they want love to they love guy. that too the yeah. Russians you know the eye contact and the intensity but after you get through the shell he's a very very um, soft guy really yeah he knows everything like you know, he, oh, he, he managed oh, and yeah. then you went with Tim Hedman yes yes and that was uh, um, two and a half years with Tim and um, you know he got to the top five as well um, and you know he, he I loved the way he played tennis. I thought that he could have accomplished much better if he had a little bit better competitive crank. He sometimes felt like he was so stylish that it was never competitor first, and he had all the tools. I mean, this guy is, okay, scratch, very good golfer, phenomenal squash player. You know, he, he was the best squash player in England, and he quit at 14, okay? And he was a scratch golfer at 14, you know? So his ability to, you know, play with eye-hand coordination was phenomenal. Um, and he was a lot of fun to work with. I mean, he beat Federer in Basel, and that's when the finals was best of five. He beat him in three straight sets, and his parents were there, and you know, that was probably the biggest compliment. They said, that's the best I've ever seen him play, and if he could just play like that, he would win multiple majors, and I said, you're right, Tony. It was his dad. You're right, Tony, and, and so, you know, he had the ability to do that. I mean, he made the semis of Wimbledon four times, I think, four or five times, and, and he never made it to a final. Um, and he made the semis of the uh, the French, which is pretty amazing. I mean, and- no, but uh, I think that he can do that. No, I know. <laughs> but he was, very, he was very good with the slice, and he was very smart. Um, but his attention had a, 
In best of fives, your attention can't wander too much. He had he had some attention problems, you know, as matches went longer. I used to say, you know, you're a 13-hole player in golf. We used to laugh about it because he would be like, unbelievable 13 holes, and then the last five holes he'd take a siesta. And then you got my call. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I remember. Yes. I mean, years before, I was without coach, talking with my agent, with my father, yes. and your name was there. Yes. And we asked Rios, hey, I didn't know that when you was finished, what happened? Yes. At that time. And I say, hey, Larry, because I have the budget. I don't have a big, really big budget. <laughs> yeah. And I asked Rios, hey, yeah. Marcelo, you know, how much yeah. is Larry? I don't remember. He told me. Yeah. Like, of course. No, yeah, I don't yeah. remember. I'm not going to go there. So after five years, I quit with the next coach. And what's your name again? And I say, oh, he was coach. He coached McEnroe, Rios, Cafali. He would like to coach me. I didn't know. And then I know that yeah. I was talking to you and also Murray was talking to you. That's right. At the same time. Yeah. And once we were talking in Rome, yes. and we were talking about coaches. Okay. And I asked him, are you talking? Yeah, I'm talking with someone. And you, yeah, but we didn't want to give names. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. well, after we, we get the call and we have like two and a half seasons of my best of That's my career. Right. Yes. And also as a person that yes. I always tell you. Yeah. And... And how was the, the feeling to go from the Europe side back to Chile? Back to Chile. And, and that, you know, that was a, a big decision because Murray was 18, 19. You were 25. Do I want to go back like the Rios experience and have to educate from a very young? And, and, and Murray was ranked 68. Okay, and you were ranked somewhere in the 20s, I believe, at yeah. the time. And so it was, it was a, a decision of... You gave all the right answers. He gave all the answers as, as an 18-year-old would because he doesn't know. Even though I knew in my mind that he was a top 10 player coming out of the juniors with Monfils because I knew his intensity. I knew the kid. I watched him at the French. Um, they played um, in a five-step match. I mean, I just knew the kid was going to be Murray. However, there's a lot of difference from coaching a 25-year-old and an 18- or 19-year-old into the cycle. So that was one thing. Um, parental involvement was another. I always write lists, the pros and cons. That's how I did it. I went right down the list and what am I going to be comfortable with? It wasn't about the money. It was what am, and the potential of someone attaining that level of what they want to be. And we talked a long time, Fernando. Yeah, I don't know many if you remember. Phone, yeah. Yeah, many, many hours over a two-month span. Because it was a big decision to go on the road with someone to really believe in their heart. Is, and see, that was the side of Murray. He, was, he didn't know anything. He was like a young kid. He's like another Rios, doesn't know what, how good they're going to be. They don't, you had a vision of where, what you wanted to do. And the problem was with you, you always gave me the right answer. And so I, was, <laughs> I kept telling, telling my wife, I said, this guy keeps, I, I throw a lot of questions and he keeps giving me the right answer, honest answers. And so that was the tipping point of what convinced me. Yeah, because me. in that time, when I quit with my coach, I was like 11, 12. And yes. Then, and a few weeks later, I get into the top 10, but just touch, you yes. know. And every, not everybody, but many people tell me, why are you going to take a coach? Yes. I mean, you're doing great. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm doing okay. Yeah. But I, I need to improve, and I want a different view of the game. Yes. So I say, I mean, at least even if I don't improve, I'm going to have more fun. I'm going to learn from the great coach. And that's what I did. I mean, I, I, we did a great job. Of course, always I would love to get a Grand Slam or a yes. gold medal. Yes. But I've, I have the, the best experience and I learned a lot from you, not yes. only on the court, outside the court and how to manage the relationships also. That's right. That's right. Uh, and then you, you went with uh, Andy Roddick. Yes. Another good challenge. Cause, that was... A, that because... Was... because uh, it's it's not like McEnroe, but it was he was Very, number one in the yeah, world. That's right. How do you manage that? Similar personalities. Now, going from someone like yourself, who is very very easy to be around, um, and and a whole different uh, nature about you as an athlete and the way you kind of went about it, to going to somebody like a Connors mentality or a McEnroe mentality, where every moment of the day the intensity and the uh, nervousness is it, it almost like never ends. So it's very draining um, as a coach. You have to know if you're going to go into that arena, that type of an individual, 
it's a whole whole different um, can of worms um, in and the sense of of energy you have to yeah. you have to give. Yeah, but because uh, you, we talk about like six players that everyone is really different. Really different. I mean, Jevy or yes. Tim, me. Yeah. yeah. And you was able to take the best. Yes. Every time. Yes. I mean, no, no miss in any any player. And, and, and what's, the, what's the? I'm not going to call a secret, but what you? What's the, the most important thing you do or you try to see in every personality? And, and we can we can kind of throw away the the let's say the toolbox, the athletic talent. If you're asking me, I really really try not to make any judgments. I have to be around the person enough to know what makes them tick. Okay, what stimulates their competitive competitiveness, how they go about their practice, uh, their habits, socially, okay, what they do outside the, the, the box, okay, and that's very important to me. I want to know what makes them tick as a person, and I don't care if you're Russian, English, American, Chilean, you know, or from the moon, you know, so it, it, that's, I have, and then I have to make those adjustments, that's part of the puzzle. I always put it as a puzzle. I feel there's about six to eight components of the puzzle, and it's just not inside the lines. Okay, with Johnny Mac, we, I had Tatum O'Neill with two kids, one on the way. I mean, there's so many different dynamics you're juggling outside the lines that carry over inside the lines, okay? Because people think you can compartmentalize these things. That's not the case. But you get success by watching what makes them tick, and then you try to make adjustments on all of those pieces of the puzzle, and that's when you probably get the, the best results. Yeah, because I, I remember first practice we had in Dusseldorf. Yes. We started practicing, and yeah. it was like half an hour, uh, and you didn't say any word. No. And I was thinking, what should I pay this guy for? <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. then I start to know you, of course. Yes. But every time you speak, it's something to improve. It's something like... Yes. Because when you talk too much, nobody listens. No. And I'm, 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 a li I, I'm looking for... One, usually, like Radek would say, give me one specific thing. I try to condense it so it's not information overload. But I'm very strict in doing it, trying to do it every time. Just like one thing, whether or not to pick up your left foot, you know, where you, your foot... And, you know... So you don't get too confused. But one yeah. thing, one thing that you did very, very well that first day, you said, Larry, I don't care if I lose matches. I said, because this is going to be very difficult from you, Fernando, because and he says, I don't care. I'm going to I'm going to play through the learning process. So that really freed me up to that. You had a very good understanding that this was going to be a little rocky road on the left side, the backhand side. But you had the best forehand in the world, maybe of all time. I mean, you got to go in the top three. OK, for me. And um, I've been around almost 50 years watching. So when you have a weapon like that and you were in your mentality was, I don't care about results right now. I'm looking for the future to winning something bigger. And what do you think about the Garin and Jari in these days? I mean, they did a big step now. Especially Garin, Garin has. Garin is, has, has really jumped in into 30 into the world. Uh, you know, I, I, I met Garin when he was uh, the 487. I flew to Northern California. He was training with uh, Horacio Mata, and um, I saw what he was like. Um, he, he's very uh, muy fuerte, you know. <laughs> I mean, very strong. Um, has a lot of tools, okay. And um, but that's just that works very very well in the juniors, because I call it being a man child. You just basically and you knew, you were a little bit like that as well in the junior. When you're so physically strong, you can just you know, knock guys off with your physicality. You don't even really need to, like, have anything else, you know. And, uh, you know, for Garin, his mentality, um, moving forward, that's going to be his next step. And whether or not he's going to take on the responsibility of wanting to be one of those players, you know, that has every single day they have to show up and get a result, a.k.a. like a erotic where he says I don't lose the guy's rank be below me you know there you know there's pressure as a coach and McEnroe McEnroe didn't like losing points oh. I can tell you stories where you know he you know he would he would lose you know one game and he'd get angry and he's beating the guy 6050 and he'd get angry so his standard the standard of being and taking on the responsibility and the intensity is going to be Gareen's biggest challenge and I'm not I've know him pretty well Okay, and he's improved greatly. But um, if he's going to stay there, as you well know, at 30 and to try to go up the ladder, 
He's going to have to make some better decisions than what he's making right now because this is his moment. He's not that young. Okay, he's 22 years old, and his, it, this, these are the moments where you make a, a push to win, like you said, when you're 25, you just for a blink, you hit 10. Okay, and you can probably look at Nicholas Jerry, why all of a sudden he was in the same position one year ago. Now he's 80 or 78 or whatever he is, and he's kind of going in the wrong direction. So you have to take a look at that. And, you, uh, and if, if both of them change or keep working, yes. you think that they can be on the top 10? They Gare need to change. They need to work. Uh, no, no, but uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced Gareen has the mentality. I really am not. I know him well enough, and I've spent enough time with him. Um, if, it, if he, I, the, the thing about top 10 is not easy to backdoor it. You know, backdoor? Like, okay, some guy gets hurt or by, you know, yeah. and all of a sudden you fill in the vacuum, yeah. okay, and move into the top 10. Uh, the way he goes about right now, unless, he can, unless I see that he's making better judgments in his career, at this moment, because, you know, the tennis career is a very small time capsule, you know, in your life. If you live to be nine, it's a 10 year span. You feel long, but it's short. Yeah, I know, <laughs> you feel like, oh, and, and, and yeah. the days are long and this is gonna last forever. It's not. And that's why it's very important to get people around that are making big time judgments, because do I think he has the tools? So that is about mentality. It is, he, he's what very about young. Jerry? Jerry is not good enough, uh, okay. fundamentally, to even be in the conversation because he doesn't have any weapon in the sense of you had a tremendous forehand. Gareen, he has a very good forehand. He play, he, his backhand is he's so, much more solid. You kind of, and he has a good serve. You know what he's going to be pretty much every day. Jerry, he, I, he comes out playing. Some balls are going all over the place and he has a very interesting service um, technique. Um, as a coach, I look You know, but I, do I think he has the potential if he got some guidance? But right now, he's got to be looking in the mirror going, geez, I can't hit two balls in a row. I mean, he's got to be worried a little bit, like, unless he's just totally not lying to himself. He's not looking. That's one thing you did when you were 25 years old. I don't know how old is Jerry. 20, 20 23, 24. Okay, so he, it's time now. Okay, do I really want to go and... and, and, and put my career, I believe in my career, I believe in myself, and get somebody that can you know, guide me through this thing and help me, and it's not gonna be easy, because he's very um, fundamentally, on, on, for a big guy with his serve and his forehand, um, that needs a lot of work, that's just, to hold up at that top 10, he's not in the conversation. That, uh, if you're saying top 50, okay, he can go to 30 to 50, 25 to 50 in that zone. Top 10, I mean, we're talking a whole different stratosphere, in my opinion, but, like, In the next few years, when Nadal, Federer, Murray, Joe, they, they start disappearing, there's a vacuum. If he does the work and, the, and he has a three-year body of work, there's no reason why he couldn't if he did the right training. But if he keeps doing the training he's doing now with the deficiencies, he's, 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 he's dreaming if he thinks he's going he's gonna to get there. I'm But sure this in, is... You know, you never know. I'm sure this is familiar for you. Oh, yes. But the, the numbers question. and the question, yeah. <laughs> Pick a number. Number three. Number three. There is a big mistake that I did that you never <laughs> told me on my career, like. Because on the paper you say that I did Yes, it. yes. The, I mean, <laughs> you know, there was, there was one moment where, you know, you attained something that you were dreaming since you were eight years old getting to the finals of a slam, um, playing as well as you did at that, that moment, that time period, um, and then being able to understand it in your mind and absorbing it as an athlete um, and getting some perspective of actually what went down in that six-week span leading through the Australian Open. And then after that, you know, there was a real rocky time period for three months, um, and I thought that had to do a lot of with experience you have never been there before um you really didn't ever and you kind of did that everyone was so shocked i wasn't shocked with the amount of work that you did and 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 how you adjusted your game to feed into your strength um but it was almost like a whirlwind okay and you're getting pulled by so many different sources you know from whether or not coming back and playing at Vina on the clay after being six weeks on on the on 
you know, the hard court and then having to play Davis Cup. And it was just a, a whirlwind. And, and at those moments, I think it's better to ch have some time to where you can, you know, absorb it, understand it, and then, and then, you know, get a game plan and move on because now you're what I call one of the big boys. And you had that moment of what I call the aura of that time. Um, and then you have to make sure that when you play, you're ready to play at the highest level. And that's the thing about getting to the top. It's not like I'm playing every week and whatever. If I lose, it doesn't matter. Okay, it does matter. Okay, and that's the top guys, you know, learn to make that transition from being able to be able to do that every single day. And they take that responsibility. And it's not easy. I'm not saying no. it's easy, but it, it's very difficult. But, you know, that's what they do. They like that drive that that competitiveness and that little bit of anxiety is it's there is it there you know you know and that's that's one thing you know you have to get make that adjustment after doing so well at that moment and getting to five in the world and you know being you know one of the big boys thank you, you know? larry thank you for your time what yes. do you mean in my life in my career yes. you're always for special your, fernando for me for coming to chile again yes and there's a little gift Thank you very much. You this, can enjoy with your family. This is this is the uh, Patagonia. Yeah, yes, all uh, around Chile. Yes. So this is a very special country for me. It's like my second home. It really is. I'm, I lived in you know Palm Springs in in the Coachella Valley, and this is a valley with mountains like that. And so when I come here, I feel very um, also wine valley. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah, you so much, wine. Larry. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Thank Fernando. You. Thank you. <laughs>